Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. And I want to thank you so much for being here today, August 14th, 2019, for our RN and Allied Health Telehealth Lecture. Uh, just a few things before we get started. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, please call us, 919-445-1000. You can email us at unccn at unc.edu. Uh, we do have a, a information-packed website at unccn.org. We have information about past lectures, upcoming lectures. You can get to our uh, learning portal where we have a year's worth of lectures, 24 professional four-credit lectures available. You can go in on, on your own time, anytime, day or night. You can uh, watch any of those uh, 24 lectures and uh, receive credit for those. And then in our learning library, we have literally hundreds of oncology telehealth lectures available for viewing as well. So lots of options there. Um, we want to say some thank yous before we get started. Uh, we have a new promoter, and, and we are so thankful to all of you who are promoters and willing to take just a few minutes every month to forward on information about these lectures and spread the word and, and increase our attendance, and that's really been working. Thank you to Nikki Hyatt from Biden uh, Cancer Center for joining us as a, as a new promoter this month. We also want to welcome three new site coordinators, Jennifer Brewer from High Point Radiation, Ashley Towers from High Point Radiation, and Sarah Percy from UNC Rex Hematology and Medical Oncology. Thank you so much to each of you for uh, agreeing to be a site coordinator. We're very glad to have you on board. We also want to say uh, thank you and farewell to Sharon Kaufman from UNC Rex Hematology and Medical Oncology. She's been promoted to Director of Oncology Nursing at UNC Rex Cancer Center uh, as of January of this year. So uh, we, it's, it, it, Sharon has just been phenomenal in the work she's been doing with us as a coordinator. So we wish her the very best. Thank you, Sharon. All right, we will be using Poll Everywhere today. Uh, if you've never used Poll Everywhere, let me do a quick run through on this. Uh, easiest way to do this is just to go to pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N. Uh, you can do that from any browser, on a smartphone, on a tablet, on a laptop, whatever. And as the questions come up, you'll see those. You'll be able to click on the answers that, that you feel are correct. And at the end, you'll be able to type in your own questions. So uh, please be thinking throughout this presentation about what questions you have, jotting those down, and then sharing those with, with our guests at the end here. Uh, if you don't have a, a, a browser of some sort in front of you and you'd prefer to use a phone with a texting capability, just uh, in the to field, type in 22333. In the message field, type in UNCCN. You'll get a little message back. It'll say uh, that you've joined, and then you can answer with the appropriate letter corresponding with the answer to the question. All of this is anonymous, and then at the end, you can type in your questions as well. So we've got uh, what I think is kind of a softball for you here at the beginning. In which part of the body does esophageal cancer occur? If you think that's the central nervous system, A, uh, genitourinary system, B, or gastrointestinal system, C. So we'll let you figure out what answer you think is, is uh, most pertinent and put that in. And uh, we'll actually put the real poll up in just a moment. All right, so without further ado, we want to welcome all of our, our two guests here. So uh, first, uh, Dr. Aurora, uh, who has research interests in, uh, focused on quality improvement as well as the study and use of novel health technologies to better evaluate and treat gastrointestinal diseases. And you're specifically looking at ways in which sensors and apps can be incorporated into clinical care. It's the future goal. <laughs> all right, well, Dr. Aurora, welcome. Thank you so, so much glad for to have you me. here. Um, and we also have Kathleen Farrell, MPAS, PAC, uh, and she has been a physician assistant in gastroenterology for 12 years and uh, worked with the Center for Esophageal Diseases and swallowing for almost 10 years and works directly with esophageal cancer patients in the endoscopic pre- and post-surgical process. Did I get that right? You did. All right, welcome. Thank so glad you. to have you here. Thanks for having and, um, 
Let's see, going, going back to the world, what's one thing we should know about you that wasn't on that little bio there? Uh, so I was actually a bass player oh. in a band in med school that was called Code Blue. Wow. And we performed at our med school graduation. <laughs> wow. Well, that's great. That's great. And Kathleen? Um, I'm a big animal lover. We have three Siberian Huskies at home. Wow. <laughs> And hopefully a heavy duty vacuum cleaner. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, that's great. Uh, let's take. Oh, okay. So we've got results back on our poll, and I think uh, not surprisingly, uh, everyone has identified that this relates to the gastrointestinal system. So thank you all so much for for the responses to that first poll. And without further ado, the many roads of esophageal cancer treatments, side effects, and common complications. And I will pass the keyboard you. as well as the mouse over to you, Dr. O'Brien. All right. Um, thank you all so much for having us today. Um, we're really excited to talk to you about changes in regards to treatments for esophageal cancers. So I'll go ahead and get started. So our agenda over the next 45 minutes, um, at first we're just going to start with the basics about esophageal cancer and then kind of divide up treatment options through two cases. The first case is going to walk you through a patient who's getting treatment for a more superficial esophageal cancer um, and some common complications that we can see from those treatment modalities. We'll then go and follow patient two um, who has a more complex and advanced cancer the treatment that's associated with that and common complications as well as management options. Our learning objectives, um, the first two and the second two actually parallel each other um, as Kathleen and I wanted to make sure that we were following kind of similar pathways uh, to make this a more effective and efficient talk. So our overall goals, we're going to be talking about common complications and side effects of both endoscopic therapies as well as um, those complications associated with esophagectomy. And then our main goal also is to really talk about post-treatment symptoms and ways to manage it because that's something I think all of us um, manage day to day and we really wanted to show what's new um, and maybe add some more tools to the toolbox for all of you. So um, our first polling question is, which of the following is the most common type of esophageal cancer? So is it A, esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, B, esophageal adenocarcinoma, and C, esophageal squamous papilloma? So I'll give you guys a few seconds. Again, this is anonymous. Thank you so much for all of you who have already uh, gone ahead and responded. It's always interesting to see the answers as, as, as they arrive. All right. How are they doing? Wonderful. So you are correct. It's B, esophageal adenocarcinoma. But what's interesting is it used to be squamous cell carcinoma. So uh, we'll actually be talking about that over the next few minutes. So just a little bit about the basics of esophageal cancer. Um, it's actually the sixth most common cancer worldwide. And this was actually surprising to even us as we were preparing this talk, uh, realizing how much more common it is worldwide especially um, and how we're seeing more and more of it. The two main types of esophageal cancer are esophageal adenocarcinoma and esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. These encompass about 95% of esophageal cancers that we see. Um, the other percentage does include things like the squamous papilloma that we had put in our poll question earlier. Now, classically, squamous cell carcinomas tend to be found more in the mid and upper esophagus, whereas adenocarcinomas are more commonly found in the distal esophagus, or what we say GEJ, meaning the gastroesophageal junction. Now, there has been an interesting rise in cases over the last 50 years. So if you go back to the 1940s or 1950s, the most common esophageal cancer we would find was squamous cell, and that was um, due to the risk factors of smoking and alcohol use. Now, what we've seen, though, is over these last 50 years, there's been a rise and actually a displacement where now the most common cancer we see is adenocarcinoma, which is related to Barrett's. Um, and so next, we kind of want to talk about the risk factors and things to just kind of classically differentiate squamous cell from adeno. So as you can see, we discussed the incident rate. So it's about three to one when we compare adenocarcinoma to squamous cell. There is a male predominance for both. 
Um, and the most common locations we discussed, again, there is a difference. So most, most commonly, middle of the esophagus or upper, upper esophagus for squamous cell carcinomas versus the distal esophagus for adenocarcinomas. And then the risk factors are actually where there is a, a big difference. So with squamous cell, smoking and alcohol use are two of the biggest risk factors, whereas with adenocarcinoma, it's Barrett's esophagus. Um, now, Barrett's is basically a transition in the type of cell that's found in the bottom of the esophagus. So if you look from left to right on the screen, this is actually the evolution of a normal esophagus to Barrett's, where what you're seeing is really this transition to that more uh, darker pink color, and that's actually intestinal metaplasia, or a change in the type of cell due to, um, with time, acid exposure. Then as it continues to get acid exposure, it begins to replicate in an atypical fashion, which can then lead to dysplasia, and then to carcinoma, or, um, as we saw at CN5, so cancers. Now, how do folks present? So actually what's interesting is about 10% of patients will actually be asymptomatic um, at the time of presentation. So these are patients that um, are coming to us, let's say they are uh, at higher risk for Barrett's, and that would be um, older men who've had heartburn for um, decades, uh, multiple, multiple years. They'll be sent for an upper endoscopy, just more for a screening purpose. And in those cases, those are some of the patients that we actually incidentally find cancers in. More commonly, though, patients present with dysphagia, which is progressive difficulty with swallowing and weight loss. Um, and a majority of the cancers are found in the bottom of the esophagus as we're seeing higher numbers of adenocarcinoma. Less than 10% of all cancers are found in the cervical esophagus, which is the upper portion of the esophagus. Now, when it comes to diagnosis, the very first step is an upper endoscopy. The goal of that is, A, to visualize the endoscopic uh, distribution of the cancer and also to get biopsies to determine what type of cancer it is that we're dealing with. Now once that's been done, the next steps are EUS, which is endoscopic ultrasound, which looks at the extent of the local disease, and we'll actually go into this a little bit more in detail, and then CT and PET scan to look for distant metastases. This in combination will allow for staging um, of the cancer itself. So endoscopic ultrasound is a newer modality that's being used, and so you'll see um, this being commonly used in our patients as the next step um, before they even can get CT scans, et cetera, because it allows definition of how, um, how far the cancer has spread within the layers. And that's what we've tried to highlight with the picture um, on the right over here. Um, so it's showing you the different layers of the esophagus and dependent on where the cancer has spread to, that will actually help determine the stage. The EUS is actually quite sensitive and specific, um, although caveat is that it's much better at picking up the subtle early mucosal disease cancers, so those that are T1A and T4, which means that they've spread to involve um, different uh, organs or mediastinal structures. So this is just an example of what it would look like if you had a more superficial cancer that was seen via endoscopic ultrasound. So you can see how there's a distortion of that normal line um, of the mucosal layer. And now we'll start with our first case. Okay, so our first patient is a 55-year-old man who has a past medical history significant for obesity, coronary artery disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, and he's had long-standing reflux issues. This is a common patient we see in our clinic. Um, so he's being referred in to manage his reflux symptoms. So he drinks alcohol every week. He does not smoke, but he's been on a PPI once a day for many years. Um, despite that, he still has breakthrough symptoms multiple times. He otherwise feels good. He's not really having any other symptoms. So our next poll question is, what would be the next best step for this patient? A, increase his PPI to twice a day. B, add Gaviscon. C, schedule him for an upper endoscopy. Or D, do a 24-hour pH impedance study, which would further evaluate his reflux. All right, and again, if you'll take just a few more seconds to, uh, to report in your, your answer. Uh, we definitely seem to be trending on yeah. one here. How are they doing? Everybody did great. C is the correct answer. You would do an upper endoscopy in this gentleman. 
um, to look at what's going on anatomically and pathologically. So here, um, his endoscopy shows this very, very subtle abnormality in the mucosal lining, which you can see right here, it's outlined in green. And that would be the very beginning stages of a cancer. So, at, so we're fortunate enough to have uh, several different endoscopic therapies for esophageal cancer if they're caught early enough. Um, we offer endoscopic mucosal resection, it, um, which we abbreviate EMR, cryotherapy, and then radiofrequency ablation. Um, and we'll go through each of those therapies. So endoscopic mucosal resection, we do this in um, most patients if they have nodularity or any bumpy areas in the esophagus, but also anybody with a T1 cancer. So if it's defined to the mucosa or submucosa, we will generally offer EMR as well. Surgery was traditionally the standard of care for those patients, but over the past several years, we've been able to offer endoscopic therapy, and it's made a huge difference. Um, the risks associated with EMR include stricturing at the uh, resection site, bleeding, and in rare cases, perforation. So here's a picture of what EMR looks like. Um, on the first, in the first box in A, you can see they've used um, APC, which is uh, a coagulation type of uh, machine that outlines where the cancer is and what they're gonna, where the spot that they're gonna work on. B is actual, the, actually the endoscope with the cap on the end and that allows them to suck, suck up the polyp or the bumpy area that they want to remove. They then place a rubber band around that and it um, is cauterized off. And then C shows you the post polypectomy site, um, which looks beautiful from an, uh, a GI standpoint. Um, and that tissue is sent off to pathology for um, a diagnosis. So cryotherapy is another option. Um, this uses liquid nitrogen or nitrous oxide to freeze the tissue, um, and it is very effective. It eradicates high-grade dysplasia in 95 to 100% of patients. Dysplasia in 85 to 90% no, of patients, and then complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia, which is the um, initial stage of Barrett's in about 55%. The long-term data with cryotherapy is really unavailable. Um, we used to offer cryotherapy a lot more frequently than we do. Um, currently, we're doing more radiofrequency ablation. Um, cryotherapy is best, though, in patients who have a torturous esophagus or if they have diffuse nodularity that we really just can't get um, EMR'd out, or if they have so much, if they have nodularity, radiofrequency ablation is not an option. Um, so we also offer cryotherapy and palliation. So in patients that have um, advanced cancers that we're not able to treat necessarily endoscopically, we'll do cryotherapy to help um, decrease the uh, tumor burden. So here is a, hopefully, video of cryotherapy. So I'll just play that for you. And this just shows they're um, spraying the liquid nitrogen onto the esophageal mucosa. And so it'll all turn bright white. And we do this usually in eight to 12 week increments. So this patient would come back in eight to 12 weeks to have the procedure done again. Um, if it's palliation, it's just done until they decide not to do it anymore. If it's to cure the cancer, then we do that until um, they don't have any more visible signs of, can of Barrett's or cancer in their esophagus. So radiofrequency ablation, or RFA, um, this one is very similar to cryotherapy in regards to what we're using it for, um, but it's different in that it uses heat to eradicate the Barrett's esophagus, um, high-grade dysplasia, or cancer cells by changing the actual cellular protein. Um, this is the most common form of ablative therapy, and we have really good success with this. 92% achieve complete eradication of high-grade dysplasia or early cancers, and 88% achieve complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia. It cannot be used if there's diffuse nodularity. Usually those patients, um, like I said, would get EMR or cryotherapy first, and there is a higher risk of stricturing with radiofrequency um, due to the depth of the burn. So here is a picture of 
radio frequency ablation. Essentially, the scope, the endoscope has a um, channel on it that they're able to pass this balloon through, and this balloon is sized to the esophagus, and then it's expanded um, to um, apply heat to the entire surface of the esophageal lumen. So endoscopic therapy is highly successful. Uh, ho our goal is to hopefully circumvent the need for esophagectomy long-term. Um, unfortunately, there is a higher than initially realized uh, recurrence rate um, with endoscopic therapy. So those patients are on a surveillance endoscopy routine for really the rest of their life. They do um, a six-month follow-up to see to make sure everything has stayed clear and then an endoscopy every year um, so that hopefully if there is a recurrence we catch it soon enough. Poor surgical candidates will receive endoscopic therapy as a palliation and that's where we offer the cryotherapy. So what happens when endoscopic therapy is no longer an option? And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Aurora. Alright, thanks. So this second half is really going to be focusing on surgical management and then the complications associated with those um, surgical procedures. So patient number two, uh, so this is a 65-year-old gentleman, has high blood pressure, uses al alcohol pretty regularly, um, high cholesterol, reflux disease, and he presents with difficulty swallowing. So we first noticed it about six months ago, and, in, and it started as just difficulty with some solids, and now it's slowly progressed. Um, now he notices it when he tries to drink um, coffee in the morning um, and have water. And he's just, he tried changing his diet, cutting out meat and breads, but unfortunately continues to notice the symptoms. He also says that he's lost about 15 pounds in the last six months. He's not sure how much of this may be just from these dietary changes, um, or maybe he's just not eating as much as he used to. And due to these red flag symptoms, the patient was sent for an upper endoscopy. So you may be asking, what are red flag symptoms? So I'm going to actually pose the opposing question. Which of the following is not a red flag symptom? And a red flag symptom would be something that would directly send our patients for an upper endoscopy before we did other evaluation. Would it be weight loss, anemia, dysphagia, or a globus sensation? And a globus sensation is a sensation that you feel like something like a frog in your throat or something sitting in your throat. So again, which of the following is not a red flag symptom? All right, if you'll take just a, a few more seconds. This is a tougher one. <laughs> uh, Dr. Aurora, is that the answer you were looking for? So um, it's actually globus sensation. Okay. Um, and I'll go through uh, red flag symptoms um, with everyone. And we wanted to highlight this because when you're seeing patients and um, they're coming to you and they may mention a newer symptom kind of offhand, so they may be coming to talk to you about something entirely different. But if they mention, you know what? I've got new weight loss, new drop in my blood counts, so a hemoglobin drop, new difficulty swallowing, new pain with swallowing, or somebody who's never really had heartburn issues before, but all of a sudden there's this new onset where they're like, this is really troublesome, but it's never been an issue. Those are actually what we consider red flag symptoms. And in those folks, we would want them to be seen sooner rather than later for upper endoscopy because these are all features of something more worrisome, specifically malignancy. So let's go back to our case. So our gentleman gets sent for an upper endoscopy. And as you can see, he has this larger, more obvious mass, and this is at the bottom of his esophagus. And because of it, you can see there's a narrowing to the lumen or the diameter of the esophagus. And so it's much more challenging, you can imagine, for food to pass through. And that's when you start noticing changes. So when the diameter of the esophagus gets to be less than 15 millimeters, that's when it's more pronounced and people will notice more difficulty with swallowing. So if someone were to come to me um, let's say open access. So I've been sent a referral to do an upper endoscopy and I unfortunately find a malignancy. The next step is really getting them into a multidisciplinary clinic. So the main goal is for them to be seeing medical oncology, surgical oncology, radiation oncology, or surgeons basically to try to determine the, the timing of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. 
A lot of times this is where in the medicine side for GI, we actually take a back seat. And then we tend to see these patients after those treatment modalities have taken effect if there are complications or side effects later on. So this is just to kind of illustrate what's happening in general when it comes to an esophagectomy. So in the majority of cases, no matter where the location of the, of the esophageal cancer is, unless it's at the very, very bottom of the esophagus, a majority of the esophagus will need to be removed um, to allow good margins. And so as you can see in picture one, that, that's the actual cancer itself that's being highlighted. And then in picture two, that the entire esophagus has now been removed to remove the uh, cancerous tissue. And the stomach has actually been pulled up and connected to that little bit of esophagus that's left. And that's really what leads to a lot of the complications that we manage as an outpatient. So I'll go through a couple of the surgical techniques. Obviously, I'm not involved with doing the surgery side, but the main reason I wanted to highlight these is um, because some of the complications are associated with the particular surgical technique that's done. So a very common one is called a transhiatal esophagectomy. And um, this is actually used for cancers that can occur at the cervical or upper esophagus as well as the mid-esophagus and at the GE junction. It involves a midline laparotomy incision as highlighted in the picture, as well as a neck incision. That neck incision is actually what differentiates it from other types of surgical techniques that are used. Now, most if you look at the risks associated specifically with transhiatal esophagectomy, um, mortality is actually quite low at 1%, but you'll notice that anastomotic leaks um, are actually quite high, so around 9% of cases. But I will highlight though that the anastomosis is much higher because of the neck incisions, which is easier to manage that complication. Other common complications are pneumonias and atelectasis, or basically where the bottoms of the lungs aren't opening as well. Um, and that's usually because a patient's not able to take in good breaths after the surgery. The second most common uh, type of surgical technique that's used is the Ivor-Lewis esophagectomy. And this is focusing specifically on cancers that are at the bottom of the esophagus or at the GE junction. It's done through an abdominal incision and then a right thoracotomy, and those are um, sort of illustrated on the picture on the right. There is an intrathoracic incision, but you're able to avoid that neck dissection or that neck incision. So because of that, there tends to be less risk for recurrent laryngeal nerve damage. Um, but as I pointed out with the other, uh, the transhiatal approach, anastomotic leaks were easier to manage with that. They're actually much more challenging to manage um, with this type of esophagectomy and does usually involve a second surgery. Um, now, because of the approach, uh, this is not a good technique for cervical cancers or even middle of the esophagus cancers because you're not able to access that area appropriately. And there is higher risks of bile reflux specifically with this type of approach. So common complications, so as soon as the surgery is done well, a patient is still um, in that original admission, the most immediate post-op complications are pneumonia, MIs, the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, and the anastomotic leaks. So these are usually caught and managed prior to discharge um, initially. So these are not things that we would usually be seeing a patient for. I just wanted to highlight these because um, as you will see these patients that are managing them, these are kind of the risks to be um, watching out for. From a GI standpoint, the concerns that we usually see patients for are anastomotic strictures, and in that case, a patient will present with difficulty swallowing, delayed gastric emptying, or basically because of this new anatomy where the stomach is being pulled up into the chest, the uh, contents that are moving through are not moving through in the same fashion that they were when the stomach was in its old anatomic position. Reflux and dumping syndrome, and we'll go through each of these to kind of highlight how the patient presents and what we do um, from a management standpoint. So to start, we have the anastomotic strictures. So it's a very, very common cause of difficulty swallowing after the esophagectomy. It can occur months out or it can occur um, within a month or so of having the procedure done. Usually um, it will be someone who's reintroduced liquids and now is going to solid foods and will say, ah, I was doing great and all of a sudden I tried to have a sandwich and it just feels like it's sitting in my chest. 
Um, and a lot of times the stricture diameter can vary. So it can go anywhere from five millimeters, which is almost like a pinpoint, to 12 millimeters. And, re and remember I mentioned before that anywhere less than 15 millimeters in esophageal diameter, you'll notice difficulty swallowing. So you can imagine at 12 millimeters, they're having difficulty with probably meats and um, drier, heftier foods. But if you're at five millimeters, you'll have difficulties with liquids as well. Um, there's variable rates of this, so if you look at different journals, it varies anywhere from about 10% to almost 40% of cases. Um, but the treatment, which is great that we have this, is just endoscopic dilation. Um, there was a recent series where they looked at how many dilations someone would need, and this actually responds quite well. On average, about two-thirds of people will have resolution of symptoms and complete opening of that stricture um, after only two dilations. And this actually is quite uh, different than other uh, common causes of strictures where we have to bring people back every two to three weeks. So this actually responds really well. People feel better quite quickly with this. The next is the delayed gastric emptying. So this occurs in about half of patients that have an esophagectomy. The main cause of it is A, a truncal vagotomy that's performed during the resection, and that's what's involved with actually movement in the bottom of the stomach to really get um, the stomach contents to empty into the small intestine. And then second, we're moving the stomach from the abdomen up into the chest. And with that, its normal con contractions are not going to occur in the same fashion that they were prior. So that in combination can make it quite challenging when a patient transitions to solid foods, which does take a little bit of time, but once they do, for it to feel comfortable and feel like it's going down um, adequately. So treatments for that um, are what we would treat any patient who has, in a sense, uh, delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis. So diabetic patients um, will also have the same management approach. Uh, the cause of their delayed gastric emptying is just different, but um, you likely see these patients and you'll um, recommend small meals throughout the day. So usually I'll start with five to six small meals. Do more of your proteins and fats earlier in the day as that will allow for more time as proteins and fats take longer to move through the GI tract. Um, avoid simple sugars, and there are some endoscopic techniques that may be of benefit. Um, in particular, in post-esophagectomy patients, we can actually um, inject Botox, and I've shown a picture of that in the top right, into the pylorus, which is the end point right before you pop into the small intestine. And what that does, just like if you were getting it for wrinkles, is it sort of just um, stops any of that contraction and just relaxes the muscle, allowing things to more gradually go down. And in a sense, because the stomach is up in the chest, it's letting gravity kind of help us out a little bit. Um, and so that's an, an, uh, an option that we're doing actually um, frequently with our post-esophagectomy patients. The next big one is reflux. Um, and there's a few reasons for why we would see reflux in our patients post-esophagectomy. So I've just highlighted with arrows the anatomic features that actually help protect our esophagus from reflux exposure, and those are one, the lower esophageal sphincter, and that is basically a very thick, thickened muscle that at rest is contracted, and then when you swallow, relaxes to allow food to go down, but then contracts again um, to basically protect you from having food from the stomach and refluxate coming up. The second is the diaphragm. It actually pinches in, and normally it will pinch in at that very same location as the lower esophageal sphincter. So it kind of gives you that secondary protective mechanism to prevent things from going up. Now you can imagine, as we do an esophagectomy, we're removing this area here, because a lot of times this is actually the location of the cancer, and we're moving the entire stomach up into the chest, thus losing the diaphragmatic pinch. So it's unfortunately kind of a setup for reflux issues. So as I'd highlighted, that lower esophageal sphincter is no longer there. The other main key point, though, is you have increased intra-abdominal pressure, and that's allowing reflux to actually pass up through the anastomosis. Um, and then if you can um, kind of imagine, we talked about delayed gastric emptying. As that reflux comes up, it has more difficulty uh, being cleared. And so there's more opportunity for it to continue to go up and down and cause symptoms for patients. So what do we do for treatment? Um, thankfully, there actually are quite a few treatment options um, that work quite well for our patients. So the first is progen pump inhibitors. If you go to any target CVS, it feels like there's an entire aisle full of these. Um, it's the most potent inhibitor of gastric acid secretion. And actually, interestingly, 
the most commonly prescribed medication in the U.S. So this is, I think, going back to maybe 2010, but there was over 100, and, 100 million prescriptions filled yearly for this particular medication. And in head-to-head -head trials, it actually um, works better than our H2 blockers, which would be like uh, ranitidine or famotidine and placebo. So let's talk a little bit more about PPIs. Um, why and how do they work? So proton pump inhibitor, basically it's suppressing gastric, basal, and stimulated acid secretion. So it's stopping acid secretion by specifically inhibiting a parietal cell hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. So it basically knocks out this pump that normally would release acid every time we eat and releases acid to kind of maintain a pH um, in our stomach of less than four. So specifically, the hydrogen potassium ATPase that's present in the parietal cell is highest after a prolonged fast. So that's why we tell a lot of our patients, take your PPI first thing in the morning because you've had the longest fast and you have the highest number of these ATPases, which are necessary. If we block them from doing their job, you're going to get the most effect out of your drug. So um, it is also recommended that these medications be taken daily. There are some medications that can be taken as needed, but it takes about five days to see the full effect of a PPI um, in the sense of having it build up in the system. And so we usually say that if you're going to be on this strength of medication, you should be taking it consistently and daily. If your symptoms are occurring less frequently, there's other options that may be better for you to take. So what are some of those other options? So this next one is um, a category that's called an alginate. I'm a huge fan of this medication and use it quite frequently in my practice. Um, and what it does is you can sort of um, imagine that you finish a meal, you feel a little bit full. There's now food and liquid that's sitting in your stomach. Now, if you have normal motility, it's going to take about two hours for liquids to move through, but it's going to take upwards of about four hours for a majority of the food to pass through. So during that time, you do get natural relaxations of the bottom of the esophagus. And this is something that happens in everyone. And when that happens, there is the probability of some of this food and liquid to then come up into the esophagus. Now let's imagine you have altered anatomy, where your stomach is slower to put to kind of pass things along, you will have longer periods of time where food and liquid are in your stomach, which gives more opportunity for that refluxate or that those contents to come up. So in our esophagectomy patients, using something like an alginate, which you would take after a meal, and once you've taken it, it creates almost like a raft or a barrier that sits on top of that food and liquid and it physically prevents it from coming up into the esophagus, or in this case, coming up further into the um, new area of where the esophagus was. Um, this works incredibly well at night, especially if patients, when they lay down, you don't really have gravity helping you. And so the scaviscon can work um, to kind of help prevent that consistent exposure. I had a patient where their biggest issue after their esophagectomy was actually having refluxate contents coming up into their throat at night, and it was affecting their sleep. So because they couldn't sleep, um, it was their day-to-day -day quality of life had just it was so much worse. This medication was enough in addition to some lifestyle modifications to actually turn this patient's entire night and day around. So the two lifestyle modifications that have been studied for reflux are elevation of the head of the bed, and by that we mean utilization of a wedge, which I've um, put in a picture of for you to see, and then a three to four hour gap between dinner and bed. And this is again to counter the amount of time it takes for food to pass from the stomach into the small intestine. The next major issue we see is dumping syndrome. Now, there's two different varieties of dumping syndrome. So there's early and late. I'm specifically talking about late dumping syndrome, and this usually occurs um, after esophagectomies or even after Roux-en-Y um, bypass surgeries. What this simply means is that you have rapid gastric emptying. So after you eat, within 60 minutes, things are rapidly moving through your small intestine. And it's especially associated with simple sugars. And it's actually causing hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia, which is what leads to the symptoms of nausea, cramping, diarrhea, and vomiting. As you can imagine, this is quite uncomfortable. If every time you eat within an hour, you just you feel so sick. Um, and so this can really affect patients' abilities to gain weight back after their surgery once they've reinitiated a diet. So there are some 
um, modifications that have been quite helpful. So one is avoiding simple sugars, because that seems to be a big trigger. Another, increasing the amount of high fiber and protein. So as I had said, those are slower to move through the GI tract. And in this case, it's actually a benefit to take some of those types of foods in. Again, the smaller frequent meals, and then separating solids and liquids. What's nice though is when it comes to dumping syndrome, a majority of times it does improve within the first few months of surgery. Now the last thing we wanted to just touch on was nutrition. We're not as actively involved with this aspect of a patient's care as an outpatient, but it is very important to their healing process. After an esophagectomy, everyone will get a jejunostomy tube placed. Um, they will start to uh, tube feeds around day two, and then the, their diet will be slowly advanced to goal to make sure that they're maintaining their caloric intake, and, and that is their main source of nutrition. They won't start oral intake until a barium swallow has been done to make sure that there isn't a leak, because as we had discussed, anastomotic leaks can occur in about 10% of patients. If there is no leak, we're okay to start liquids. Usually, um, patients will stay on liquids for at least the first few weeks until uh, swelling has gone down, and that allows them to eat more um, comfortably. And then we'll have patients slowly expand as tolerated. If I do see a patient that is having um, difficulties with this transition, uh, we usually will get our nutrition colleagues involved as they are um, our greatest asset to help with this process. And so overall, um, the treatment algorithm for esophageal cancer has actually changed and there's a lot more options for our patients, especially if we're catching those cancers earlier. Um, and the endoscopic side of things has really blossomed, which is something we wanted to highlight for you today. Um, although the mainstay is still this multidisciplinary approach um, and surgery is still the most common treatment, there are um, complications associated with that, but we hope that we've sort of showed that there are multiple management options to make the quality of life for our patients a little bit better. So um, thank you all, uh, and we were going to open things up for questions. Great. And uh, Dr. Aurora, if you would yes, pass me the keyboard and the mouse. All right. And bear with me for just a moment. I just need to uh, move things over to our Q&A page, and there are references. And of course, uh, all of these slides are online. Um, let's see. We'll, there we go. There's our Q&A. Um, so while we're waiting for questions, uh, I have a few. Um, you mentioned the, 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 the transition from uh, squamous cell to uh, adenocarcinoma being the most prevalent. Now, I would assume some of the decline in squamous cell would be due to decreases in, in smoking. Is Absolutely. that correct? So more modifications in risk factors. Mm -hmm. I think because we were able to strongly connect squamous cell carcinoma with smoking and alcohol, we were oh. able to kind of... Um, curtail those activities a little bit earlier because we did see such a direct correlation. Okay. But when it comes to adenocarcinoma, mm -hmm. we don't have as much control over the factors associated with its progression. And a lot of times yeah. you won't know that there's an issue until it's progressed. Gotcha. And so we're actually working on studies right now to figure out the best way to get patients that are more at risk for Barrett's mm -hmm. to get in for upper endoscopy so we can follow them um, to prevent that transition to adenocarcinoma. Gotcha. And, and, and is there an actual increase in the, in the prevalence of Barrett's? Is that part of what's going on, or do we know? It's kind of hard to say. So I think mm -hmm. there has been, mm -hmm. but I do think that we're probably capturing it better okay. um, because we are now bringing people in for upper endoscopies okay. and catching it at a point where we're able to survey them. But there is a lot of study um, going on right now in how often should we survey patients, mm -hmm. what's the best management options. It used to be twice a day um, mm -hmm. proton pump inhibitors. Now it's daily. We used to say surveillance um, every three years. Now there's a question of potentially stretching that out to three to five years okay. um, because that transition from Barrett's to dys dysplastic changes to adeno is actually quite low, mm -hmm. but because there's such a broad number of people that could be encompassed within that, we still want to make sure we're catching people early on. Right, absolutely. And, and do we, if, 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 if in fact there's an increase in Barrett's, do we know what that's attributed to? So probably, so we think heartburn um, mm -hmm. and reflux exposure is what causes this continued damage. Right. So um, things that would worsen that may be associated. Mm -hmm. Don't think I could say that there is a direct causation, like because we see this much more reflux, we're now seeing X amount. Sure, heartburns. But sure. Um, with increases in obesity, which increases intra abdominal pressure and worsening reflux um, exposure, that does put people more at Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, thank you. And we do have some questions starting to come in. Uh, I want to remind all 
all of you in our audience, please uh, send those questions in. Uh, we, we do have uh, some time left, so we'll look forward to answering as many as we can. Uh, any role in chemotherapy or target therapy? It's a really good question that um, we unfortunately are not as actively involved with um, mm -hmm. on the GI medicine side. And I know they are looking at more targeted therapies um, for uh, esophageal cancers, but on our end, we tend to manage the squamous and adeno if it's caught early, very similarly um, by removing the, the affected tissue. Um, and so we don't have yet differentiation um, that gotcha. we can do that's more targeted. Gotcha. And uh, are there nutritional food recommendations to avoid or delay Barrett's? Really just to avoid the things that are going to increase your acid exposure. So mm -hmm. you want to cut out like your spicy foods, greasy, um, high fat foods, the um, caffeine, uh, those types of things are alcohol even, um, and smoking um, just because of the increased risk of reflux issues. And that's going to be what compounds or what increases your risk of developing beards. Plus white men over the age of 50 are even at a higher risk anyway. Uh -huh. yeah. And what's interesting is that um, with people, each person could be a little bit different in regards to what their food triggers are. So there are classic food triggers, as Kathleen mentioned, with um, caffeine, chocolate, tomatoes, things we enjoy. Um, but for some, there are particular food triggers that um, will lead to those relaxations of the bottom of the esophagus, which is what causes that reflux exposure in the esophagus. So we usually say that if there's certain foods that you notice that may not be in that classic list, but cause um, heartburn symptoms for you, then it is something to consider Avoiding. Will will a patient typically know that that she or he is is addressing this simply by the relief of those those heartburn like symptoms, um, or, or or is that how how valid is that versus uh, more more involved diagnostics? So we do have patients that have what's called silent reflux, and mm -hmm. so it won't matter kind of okay. what they do as okay. far as diet elimination. Gotcha. But um, I think for the majority of our patients, they will notice a huge symptom improvement Great. Um, with avoiding certain triggers. So like pizza. So tomato yeah. sauce uh, for me every time, <laughs> without a doubt, leads to heartburn symptoms. So I feel like I found my food trigger. Uh, I just need to be better about avoiding it. But there are, there are for those, if you're worried about your... Um, your patient or even yourself and mm -hmm. you want to know well i'm having symptoms i'm taking medication but i'm having breakthrough symptoms that's the situation where um, it's great to come and see one of us in clinic there are other more objective modalities that we can use um, in our polling question we had mentioned ph impedance studies mm -hmm. and those are studies that allow us to see over 24 hours how many times do you have reflux um, how, what extent does it actually go up in the esophagus? Is it acidic or non-acidic? And that can help mm -hmm. us guide and tailor therapies, especially if it's affecting quality of life. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, does stress in, increase uh, GERD? Group? Probably. Yes. <laughs> um, so this would be more of like a functional dyspepsia type of thing, but mm -hmm. um, stress, as everybody knows, can affect the GI tract, whether it's from heartburn symptoms, reflux, abdominal pain, cramping, diarrhea, all of those things are kind of increased with stress. So absolutely. Yeah. It's a very strong connection between the brain and the gut. Yeah. Um, and we're realizing that more and more mm -hmm. as you see patients. So an example being that coming to give this talk, mm -hmm. um, you're, you may <laughs> feel some, some mild GI symptoms, and that's, <laughs> um, which kind of relates to stress. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> no, we are not advocating no, no. not having guests here in order to alleviate these symptoms. Um, but everybody's, I think everyone deals with stress a little differently and the uh -huh. body does show manifestations of that stress. And we do see right. it quite often with mm -hmm. the GI tract. So when you are managing patients who have GI symptoms, I think you have to think um, more holistically that we're not just managing the pathophysiology, but we're mm -hmm. also managing um, the, the stress and the impacts that that may have as an overlay. Gotcha. So, and, and are you specifically um, addressing stress relief techniques with patients at times as, as a mechanism yeah. for relieving symptoms? Um, so, it's something I'll actually bring up quite often with patients is to ask, like, when your symptoms started, was there a stressor associated mm -hmm. around that time? And if you do, a lot of times you can actually say, I, um, I started a new job 
the, the hours were much um, more stressful for me to manage things. And that's when I noticed that I started having worsening of the heartburn. Now, very well could be that that change in your job may have led to dietary modifications, but sure. it could be that in addition, just the stress of that life change. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, um, we will suggest um, stress management techniques, um, mindfulness, breathing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some apps that actually um, for, for mindfulness that are out meditation. there. Yeah, mm -hmm. and meditation as well. So I think it's great to think about other um, opportunities to manage stress outside of just um, managing the symptoms that gotcha. may be a consequence of it. Gotcha. Uh, all of these are great questions. Thank you uh, to all of those in, in the audience asking these. Um, is there a genetic, uh, excuse me, a genetic component to Barrett's? Do we know? We do see some yeah. familial mm -hmm. Barrett's. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's researched as much as yeah. as other familial uh -huh. cancers, like yeah. Lynch syndrome or something like that. But we do see familial um, inheritance. I would say yes. Okay. Um, has there been uh, any research or development of an artificial esophagus to prevent the issue of having to bring the stomach into the chest? Um, so there are, there is for some where if the stomach isn't a viable option that you can use um, part of the colon, so you can do a colonic mm -hmm. interposition, mm -hmm. um, but due to the way that the colon over time will stretch and will actually become, we say it's tortuous, almost um, S-shaped, it can actually have its own secondary complications and risks associated with mm -hmm. it. So we do have a few patients that actually when we will go in, we'll have strictures um, at the colonic connection point, but they have a lot more difficulty swallowing because of tortuosity or that S-shaped kind of change. Mm -hmm. But there are other options. Um, it seems thus far that the gastric pull-up has the most been the most effective. Though. Okay. I think I remember part of a, of a Grey's Anatomy where they were uh, computer generating a part of an esophagus. Is that, is that a ways yeah. away in terms of practice? Yeah. That would be pretty amazing. We could do three French immersion. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, there are so many PPIs on the market. Um, is there any PPI that works better than others? Is this patient specific? Um, how, how, how does this all work? So there's actually no head-to-head -head trials mm -hmm. comparing one PPI to another, um, but the, what we tend to do is we start with one because the overall mechanism is the same. Um, and if someone over time feels that they've lost their um, or in, their tolerance has increased to it, we, you can try switching them to another, but um, there isn't really one that is considered the most potent. Um, okay. But there is maybe some mild variation, but I think mm -hmm. for management of symptoms, any of them would be effective. The one major difference is that there's one um, Dexalant which is works throughout the day, whereas the other ones have to be more specifically taken in accordance with a meal, mm -hmm. um, like 30 to 45 minutes prior. So if that plays a role in someone's day-to-day -day where it's too challenging to take it a tiny sure. sensitive way, then you may want to consider an alternative. Okay, okay, good. Thanks so much to our audience for all of those questions. I'm going to slip in one more because I've got to ask about this, Dr. Aurora. Uh, in the description at the beginning, we talked about sensors and apps. Mm -hmm. uh, how, are you, how are you looking at applying sensors and apps so, to your work? It's something that so I've, um, I've been trying to use more apps in my day-to-day -day clinical practice, mm -hmm. and most of that is for data collection for patients because mm -hmm. I think um, you're coming to see your doctor once, say, every two months, three months. Right. So much of life has happened that a lot of times when you ask, when did a symptom start? And I'm guilty of this as well. Ah, oh, I'm not really sure. How right. is that evolved? Sure. Because it's your day to day. You sure. don't notice unless there's a big change. So um, I've used, been using apps for uh, calorie counts actually mm -hmm. to help um, with uh, symptoms to collect data on when you eat certain foods, are you having symptoms, how severe it is. So we can actually pull the general thread through and see if we can figure out what's specifically troubling a particular Gotcha. Um, and then I use apps for mindfulness as well. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to incorporate more um, for FODMAP, the diet that's involved for um, bloating and distension. There's mm -hmm. some great apps um, out there as well. So this is kind of small ways where, yes, they don't connect yet with our EPIC system. I think broadly that probably will be something in the future. Um, but I think each of us is trying to find ways to incorporate technology because it's so pervasive otherwise. Sure, sure. All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to go back one slide and, and uh, start on our thank yous. We want to thank uh, the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support of the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and the University Cancer Research Fund. Uh, we want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and uh, John Powell for all the hard work that they do for this and every one of our lectures. Um, 
We want to let you know about upcoming live lectures, uh, Best of ASCO 2019, that's a medical and surgical oncology lecture uh, with Dr. Weiss and uh, Dr. Rose, so we hope that you'll join us for that. Um, August 28th and then September 11th, Professional Development and Continuing Education for Oncology Nurses, that's our RN and Allied Health uh, program. And uh, in terms of the, the certifications, the only difference between these two is the MedSurge has the CME in addition to the CNE, ASRT, and ACPE credit that's available for both series. Uh, let's see, self-paced online courses, two new ones. Uh, we've got Decision Making in Metastatic Breast Cancer with Dr. Carey and then uh, Helping Patients with Breast Cancer with Katherine Harrell. Uh, both of those are now available. And once in a while, I, I keep hearing from people still, and they say, gosh, we love the live lectures, but I just don't have time to be there at that particular time. Well, we now have, on any given day, about 24 four-credit lectures that are available through our portal. These are all free. That's 24 credit hours. Uh, 12 of those are CME, and 24 are uh, CNE, uh, ASRT, and uh, ACPE. So uh, please spread the word on that, and I uh, just want to make sure everyone knows that those are available, um, all oncology-based, all free. More courses online as well, improving outcomes in radical um, cystectomy uh, with Dr. Pruthi and uh, Radiation Oncology 101 with uh, Jane Campurillo and, uh, and uh, Mary Fleming Knowles. So both of those are available as well. Cancer Conversations, these are not for credit, but these are uh, great community-oriented community courses. Um, it gets started with exercise on August 30th and prostate cancer screening does it save lives on September 27th. All right, thank you all. Remember unccn.org, uh, sign up for our newsletter, ask us questions, lots of information there. Um, Dr. Aurora, thank you so oh, much for, for being us. here. Yeah. Kathleen, thank you so thank much. You. This has been great. Thank you. All right, until next time, we'll hope to see you in just a couple of weeks. Thank you so much.